Thank you for uh, the opportunity to speak at uh, Marina Money again. Um, uh, I'm gonna do a presentation where we go through um, uh, the global oil market and then uh, make some of those consequences into uh, the tanker market uh, at the end. So, but uh, let's just start by looking at uh, the performance of uh, historical oil prices. Well, if you look at the, the Brent price and the historical performance, people probably think that 2020 was the most special year we've ever seen in the oil market. But uh, the fact is that uh, it, it really isn't. Uh, when you look at the, the spread between the highest and the lowest price traded through a year uh, and for the last 10 years, the average is actually $34 per barrel between the highest uh, and the lowest price through the year. Uh, so, um, uh, and we've seen, for example, in 2008, uh, the spread between the, uh, the lowest and highest price was almost $110 per barrel. And of course, 2020 was among the highest and most special years at almost $50 per barrel between the highest and the lowest price. But um, it's not really <laughs> standing out as the, the most special year. Um, and of course, um, um, we, we should be used to, uh, to a lot of uh, volatility in the oil market. And if you look, just look at the last 10 quarters, the average spread there is $20 per barrel, just within a quarter. So people tend to be surprised when we see a $10 move up or down. But uh, you have to remember, these things are normal, very normal to see a 10 to $20 move even within a quarter. So, so what has been special is, uh, is the demand uh, side, of course, uh, and what COVID has done to the demand side, because that is unprecedented. Um, if, you, if you look at the historical data here, uh, that starts uh, approximately after the change of the millennium, uh, we entered the millennium um, with about 1.7% annual growth. That was the trend line growth for oil. And then we saw the, the financial crisis hit in 2008 and 9. But then the market uh, fairly quickly returned to almost the same type of growth. Uh, we had about one and a half percent annual growth uh, after the financial crisis, but then COVID hit with unprecedented uh, uh, strength, of course, because it basically took away people's uh, ability to move because of the, um, uh, of, of the um, to, you know, to keep the infection rates in check. Uh, now, uh, I am assuming, like many others, I'll show you, uh, I've tracked the 13 influential analysts, including uh, the agencies, IEA, OPEC, and uh, Department of Energy, um, for example, uh, tracked uh, a lot of analysts, uh, and um, it seems to be huge agreement that we'll see a, a very large demand recovery through 2021, and I'll show you how others are looking later. So uh, I'm assuming in my balance is that we will return to um, above 100 million per day uh, into 2022. Uh, some analysts believe it's going to happen already in 2021 at the end of this year. Uh, and some actually think that we have seen peak uh, oil demand already. Uh, and I'll say a little bit uh, a net zero report that the IEA published um, on Tuesday this week or where they actually said what is required to, to get to uh, net zero emissions by 2050. And in that case, we have to uh, basically um, have seen the peak oil demand uh, already. Then we're supposed to go from nine millimeters per day in 2020 to 24 millimeters per day in, in 2050. But we'll get, get back to that. So, But I'm assuming then after we have recovered from COVID crisis that we will see very anemic and weak uh, oil demand growth after that until uh, for the rest of the decade. Uh, and the reason why oil demand uh, continues to increase and has done that for uh, almost uh, all the years looking back in time, if you go back and look at the BP stats, which starts in 1965, a graph up to the left there, um, which has some uh, longer time series. So that's why when you look at longer time series, uh, it's better to use the BP stats than the IA data. So you can see we've seen periods with the demand growth before the COVID crisis. It was the 19, um, uh, early 1980s, 79 to 83. Uh, then we saw a large demand destruction incident where people actually almost stopped using oil for power generation purposes. So that market was lost already in the early 80s. Um, 
liquid for power generation. And then we saw the financial crisis, this bump here in 2008 and 9. It's not very visible, as you can see in the in the broad perspective when you when you go back to 1965, but it still was seen as a huge incident. Uh, but COVID was, of course, uh, uh, a lot larger. Um, and what's driving this demand growth is basically three things. It's the, the fact that the population keeps growing. Uh, and of course, um, nobody thinks the population will stop growing um, the next 10 or 20 years. Uh, the UN prediction is that um, uh, at the weakest in, in, of the part of the co confidence interval is that we will reach uh, 9 billion people by 2050. Uh, and that's the lowest part of that interval. And of course, urbanization is a big part. When when urbanization increases um, uh, on, on the expense of, of uh, the rural population, uh, then people start to use commercial energy. Uh, so that increases the, the, the formal use of energy and energy that you actually pay for. So that's driving energy demand. And of course, um, a growing class, as you can see on the graph down to the right there, uh, all the big um, um, populated countries in the world, they are um, growing their middle class still. So that is not over, even though we saw uh, a bump in the road for a growing middle class in 2020 due to the COVID crisis. Um, but um, that is likely to recover. Now, what do we use oil for? Well, most people know that transportation is the biggest part, uh, and that is, uh, of course, correct. Uh, and when you look at transportation, you can see that passenger vehicles is about 28% uh, of the cake. Um, that market is almost entirely a gasoline market. So passenger vehicles, uh, in Europe, we use diesel for passenger vehicles, but uh, Europe is basically almost the only place people use diesel for, for, for um, passenger vehicles for most of the other part of this gasoline market. The diesel market is mainly for the trucking side, the movement of goods. And then you can see aviation is about 8%, and we have shipping at uh, 5%, and a huge growth in petrochemicals, which is really the... Uh, one of the key growth factors, uh, and, and it's going to continue to be that going forward as well. And as you can see, power generation is only 4% of, uh, of the oil consumption cake. Uh, um, so that market, I mean, you can't lose what you don't have. Uh, and the mar oil market doesn't have a generation market anymore. So it almost doesn't matter if the cost for solar and wind becomes almost zero for the oil market you have to go through electric vehicles to, to basically see that function uh, towards power generation for the oil market. Uh, and it's important to know because when you look at the distillate tower where you put in the crude oil, uh, most people tend to think about uh, you know, what we use oil for. Well, it's for the cars, it's for the, the planes, it's for the trains, it's for the ships, but we use it for a lot of other things as well. Uh, and actually, the non-burnable part of the oil consumption has already reached 17 million barrels per day, about 17% uh, of, of, the, uh, of the oil barrel. Uh, and that's things like uh, bitumens for, for roads and for roofing. It's uh, lubricating oils. Uh, it's uh, plastic chemicals. And, you know, whenever you look around, you will, you'll see oil products. Um, so, I mean, it's used for, for almost everything uh, around us, from footballs to shoes, to umbrellas, to tents, to, you know, toys, for film, for glasses, for cleaning products, for basically anything you can think about. And that market, we don't have any uh, substitution products that can actually take that market as of now with the current technology. So it's very hard to see that that part of the market shouldn't grow further. Uh, and, and with that as a backdrop, sometimes I, I, I think it's a little strange to see demonstrators against the oil industry sitting in, uh, in canoes and wearing clothes where, you know, basically everything you see that they're using and wearing is made out of oil. But, um, but that's just a, a sidetrack here for when you look at the future um, demand forecasts, uh, almost uh, everyone expect demand to grow for some particular parts of the of the oil sectors that, that we use oil for. Uh, trucking, for example, heavy duty trucking will continue to grow. Aviation will continue to grow after we've uh, recovered from the COVID crisis because there's no reason to, to think that the growing middle class um, isn't going to um, the way the current middle class is doing. 
shipping is, a, is more of a flatlining thing, uh, but petrochemicals, uh, everybody expects petrochemicals to grow. So it's basically heavy duty trucking, it's aviation, it's petrochemicals. That's the kind of a growth uh, sectors in the oil uh, market. Passenger vehicles will flat out and probably start falling already in, in this current decade. I'll show you some more calculations on that later. Um, Bloomberg New Energy Finance has some of the same type of forecasts um, as the IA, um, and also actually my own forecast. Uh, they see a peak around uh, 105 millimeters per day approximately between 2030 to 2035. Uh, uh, and the big drop is basically transportation from the passenger vehicles, as you can see. It has to do with the Tesla story and the electric vehicles that are going to be make a, a huge impact um, with um, within the current decade. Well, probably uh, aviation, chemical feedstocks, um, uh, and the heavy duty trucking uh, is going to last longer because um, uh, still it's uh, the technology is not there to move the heavy duty trucks uh, from um, the port of San Francisco over the Rocky Mountains and you know distribute those long distance uh, haul uh, trucking. But it's probably gone out there. It's just not for this decade, um, the way I see it. Now, uh, if you look at the, um, the, the oil market then uh, and market share, uh, we have seen a drop in the market share. You know, oil used to be more than half uh, of the, um, to have more than half of the market share for uh, energy in the world in the 1970s. Uh, then we saw a, a huge price spike uh, around 1980 from 79 to 83. We had the Iran-Iraq war, we had the revolution in Iran, oil prices spiked and people stopped using uh, oil for power generation, basically. That's why oil lost so much market share in the, into the early 80s. The prices stabilized uh, and the market share stabilized uh, at about 43, 44%. And what happened next and what went into the current millennium around the year 2000, uh, oil prices started to rise. Uh, much of it due to underinvestments and, and the fact that Chinese oil demand kept growing so quickly. Um, and then oil prices uh, went to the highest levels we had ever seen, uh, and we saw the longest period of rising prices as well, uh, because we saw uh, 12 out of 14 years uh, after the change of the millennium with rising prices. Then that uh, led to loss of market share. But then Oil prices collapsed uh, around 2015 from $110 plus that we had from 2011 to 14 as average, uh, down to 50 ish dollars per barrel. And then the market share uh, loss uh, basically disappeared again. So it flattened out. But my assumption now is that we will see high enough oil prices and we will see a, a, a huge uh, impact from the electric vehicles coming in. So we will see a loss of market share for oil uh, in the coming years. But despite that, uh, the, the effect doesn't come material enough before we pass 2030. You know, the number of, of vehicles on the road that are running on something else than um, uh, diesel and gasoline. So my base case is that we'll round 20, somewhere between 2030 to uh, 35 uh, will peak at around 104, 105 million barrels per day. And then we will drop down and, and we will hit that uh, red dotted line, which is basically if you, if you um, extrapolate uh, the non-burned oil, uh, those 17 million barrels per day, and assume that they're going to, uh, that part of the market is going to grow 2% per year uh, going forward as well, which is the, the, the growth rate the last uh, five, six, eight years then uh, we will hit um, uh, that uh, dotted line and we'll still have a lot of oil demand even though it's not burned. So it doesn't go into the calculations for CO2 emissions the same way as, uh, as of course, uh, the combusted uh, consumption. Now, the key thing to follow in the oil market, of course, is that, or to be aware of when you start analyzing the oil market, is that it's a totally global market. Um, natural gas is about to become a global market. It's not fully there yet. And of course, electricity is not a global market at all, but the oil market is a totally global market. Uh, and then we have to look at where people live basically. And people generally don't live in the, in the Northern uh, hemisphere, like the US and Europe is only 10% of the world. 
uh, 54% of the world lives inside this tiny circle here, of course, with India and China being the largest ones population wise. Uh, but even a country like Bangladesh, you know, is much larger than Russia, for example, in population. So uh, this is this has to be the starting point for uh, for a global view on the demand side uh, for the oil market. And one of the clearest uh, trends that we've seen in the oil market um, for the last 10, 15 years is the growing short position of the um, uh, Pacific Basin. If you look at the East Africa and Asia Pacific, um, their net balance, and here I'm not including uh, OPEC and the Middle East, this is, this is East Africa and Asia Pacific, that part of the, of the, um, uh, the world is growing shorter and shorter all the time because that's where demand is growing. Uh, and also that's where supply uh, outside of OPEC is not growing. Like for example, production in, uh, in Indonesia and production in China is also, it's not growing but they have growing demand. So they're growing shorter and shorter. We had this blip, of course, with the COVID here, as you can see, very visible COVID effect here, but we're back to, to um, uh, a lower level again, because China has been so successful in, uh, in handling of, uh, of the COVID. But of course, India is still struggling, but that uh, will, so that's why we have this little bump again up uh, in, in the um, net short position, but, drag this further on two, three, four years, this is probably going to continue to, to go the net short position uh, in, in Asia. And if you look at the, the key uh, driver in the oil market, as I already said, passenger vehicles, motor vehicle sales are back up uh, to where we were uh, before COVID. Uh, and it's uh, again driven by uh, Asia mainly. Uh, so if you look at uh, Asia and China put together Europe and, and the USA, uh, you'll don't reach the sales of motor vehicles that we see in Asia. So it's really just uh, emphasizing the, the picture of people live in this world and where the, the, the population is growing and where the middle class is growing and where urbanization is growing. So what's happening with the uh, automobile fleets? Well, if you look at China, yeah, there's a big growth in electric vehicle sales in China. And they are by far the largest market for electric vehicles uh, in the world. But as you can see here, still about 90% of the vehicles sold are running on gasoline in China. It's starting to move, it's starting to be visible in the graph, but there's still quite a long way to go. Uh, for the US, it's uh, definitely more like an evolution than a revision when you look at uh, the data for electric vehicles. Um, uh, and when you look at the type of cars they're buying in the US, it's uh, the market share for, for light trucks, the big cars has really um, grown a lot since the, the oil price uh, fell back around 2015. I'll get back to that point later, but that has actually meant that the efficiency of the US car fleet has, uh, has stopped improving the last three years. Um, but of course, now we have um, a Ford uh, F-150 pickup truck is going to go electric. So uh, we will see large effects also in the US. And that's baked to my assumptions. Of course, where things are really happening now is Europe. Uh, and you can see German electric vehicles market has really increased a lot, uh, particularly after uh, uh, well, the last one and a half year. Uh, and Germany is a fairly sizable market, but still quite small uh, compared to the US and the East market. Uh, so, so Europe is not really matching um, the market size of, of US and, and China. So there's a lot more uh, that needs to happen here. So when you look at some calculations on electric uh, vehicles, assume that the IEA is correct in their uh, sustainable development scenario. Um, uh, where they actually, in that scenario, assume that we will have um, um, all, almost a 46% um, market share in, uh, in 2030 for electric vehicles. Uh, this is assuming my um, assumption for total car sales. Uh, the IA has somewhat higher, higher baked into their uh, forecast. Then stock of electric vehicles will then reach 16% um, in, um, in um, 2030. And um, 
uh, and the uh, annual sales of passenger vehicles, assuming that will go back up to 80 million uh, this year, and then it'll grow by about 1% per year, which is the, uh, a little bit weaker than the growth of the global population. And then we come to, to a very important assumption, uh, which actually uh, is different from, for example, the iPhone story. Uh, the annual scrap rate is assumed to be 5%, so that means uh, a 20-year lifetime of a vehicle. And of course, in Europe and the US, the average car on the road about 11.4 years. So that means uh, the lifetime of, of a car, you can multiply that with two then, uh, because you're, the car on the road is in the middle of the distribution curve, of course. So, so that means uh, in, in the US uh, and EU, the cars are actually more than 20 years. Um, uh, and of course, when uh, an old car in Europe is sold, it normally ends up in Africa. When an older car in the US is sold, it normally ends up in South America. Uh, and I'm also assuming a driving length per car, similar to 2019 levels, uh, 13,500 kilometers a year and an improvement in fuel efficiency for the combustion engine vehicles at about 1%. This is actually also higher than the historical 0.7% that we've seen in the US from, uh, for, for the last uh, five, six years. So with those assumptions, you can see that even sustainable development scenario with a market share of 46% of, uh, of electric vehicles, um, after the COVID re return, we drop demand from 23 to 21 millimeters per day. So that's not really uh, uh, a number is, is destroying the oil market. And, and uh, if you look at um, an assumption that is more uh, in line with the um, state policy scenario from the IA, uh, which is actually the, uh, the scenario where we use what the politicians promised um, uh, to enforce, the demand will uh, uh, drop by maybe a half to one millimeters per day. Uh, by 2030 for, for this segment. So we need actually a lot larger uh, market share for electric vehicles than these numbers. Um, and actually in the net zero scenario, they're assuming 64% market share for electric vehicles. We'll get back to that a little bit later. But the key thing is here, if you want to have a huge and quick effect on this segment, you have to change the scrap assumption. You have to change the, uh, the lifetime vehicle. Uh, so, so you have to assume that people are actually not allowed to drive maybe a five-year-old gasoline vehicle. Um, uh, and and that, that doesn't look very plausible to me. Uh, we've seen uh, some new scrapping rules in, in India, but they are suggesting uh, that you, you're forced to scrap your car after the years, not after five years. So it's going to be uh, very bold by any politician to basically uh, remove that value from uh, from their electorate to, to say that, well, you have to scrap your almost new gasoline vehicle. Uh, but that's what happened to the iPhones, you know, when, that, when iPhones came in 2007, people took their brand new Nokia and they threw it in the bin. And that's not going to happen to the, to the global car fleet. And oh, there's some other facts that play as, uh, as well here. And that is, it's not only cost that matters, uh, it's also the, uh, the uh, security of, uh, of uh, charging your car. So if you live here, for example, in New Delhi, this is a picture from New Delhi, um, would you actually prefer to have a Nissan Leaf that you have to find somewhere to charge it? Would you actually buy uh, instead a Toyota Crown? Um, I've been four or five times to New Delhi and Mumbai, and actually this is how it looks for a uh, large part of, of those cities. And of course, how would you, why would you uh, own a car where you, you, never, be, you never know when, you, when you'll be able to charge it? So it has to be a lot of investment in, in charging infrastructure in order to even be able to take the choice of owning an electric vehicle. Um, so in Norway, this works where people uh, charge their car 90% of the time uh, where they live it, at their home. But uh, you couldn't uh, expect that in, in big cities like uh, Mumbai and Delhi and so forth. Now, uh, other things that are, that are preventing uh, a huge drop in the, uh, in the oil demand uh, very quickly from the light duty vehicles is the fact that in the US, uh, people are buying larger and larger trucks after the oil price collapsed. That's preventing the efficiency improvement um, in the U.S. car fleet. So as you can see here, the, 
the observed uh, car efficiency in miles per gallon in the US has stalled the last three years. And that's because people change sedan over to a light truck uh, and an SUV. And of course, even if the SUVs and the light trucks are much more efficient than just 10 years ago, that the, really doesn't help when you move from a, a sedan to a smaller car to a larger car. Uh, and what we have seen in the US uh, so far this year is a very large recovery in, uh, in driving. Uh, the latest numbers we have for uh, vehicle miles driven on the roads in the US is from March. And as you can see on the graph to the left, we have picked up to almost um, the same levels as we saw before COVID when it comes to vehicle miles driven. And we can also now use uh, Apple mobility data to track more real-time data, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis even, uh, that shows that um, in, in the middle of March, we saw a big recovery, but we've gone even further uh, since March. And that's supposed to happen in the US. Yeah, there's a seasonality. It actually peaks in the, in the summertime, of course, when it comes to driving in the US. So actually, uh, it's very likely that we'll see um, uh, a rude season this year uh, in the US when it comes to driving and hence also gasoline demand. Uh, so US um, oil demand, as you can see here on the graph up to the left, their total oil demand uh, has recovered up to about the five-year average uh, after the COVID situation last year. And gasoline demand is slightly above the five-year average and is to increase the next three months where it normally peaks then in August before it drops back again. Uh, and my prediction is that we're gonna see a record season this year. We, uh, we are very likely to see record gasoline demand in the US during the summer, uh, because a lot of people are, uh, are booking uh, theme park travels and uh, there's uh, some surveys suggesting that people will really hit the roads. Uh, and of course, there's a, there's a relief factor here after the COVID and they have vaccinated much the share large share of their population. Now that's gonna require much higher crude runs, uh, which is the demand for crude oil, uh, which is probably going to increase. Um, uh, it could increase one and a half to two million barrels per day, maybe at the, at the best scenario uh, in the US alone. Uh, crude production in the US, however, is, has not increased so far this year, but it's probably going to increase from here because the price has reached high enough levels to see activity increasing. When you look at the US um, oil market and their activity in the, in the shale space, they have increased the number of completed wells, and that will probably continue to increase going forward. In the last recovery uh, after uh, the the oil crisis, when the oil price uh, crashed in 2015 to 16, we saw about 40 wells per month uh, in the recovery phase, an increase, monthly increase of 40 wells per month. I'm, I'm assuming somewhat weaker uh, recovery this year because we have seen much more discipline among the US shale players. Um, we see that um, uh, there's been a lot of consolidation in the space. Um, now, uh, oil production owned by listed companies is a lot higher than uh, than earlier. There's been um, and the listed companies are communicating and have so far uh, kept their words to prioritize reducing debt and paying dividends and back shares before they use cash to drill. So so I'm assuming a somewhat weaker recovery, but still a, a quite large recovery. Uh, and also, according to Bloomberg, uh, New Energy Finance and their tracking of, uh, of performance for wells in their first six months of production, actually um, productivity improvements have stalled in the US from 2019 to 2020. So I'm assuming contribution per well stays fairly flattish going forward. Then we will see what my model spits out. As you can see, uh, the model has been fairly well on uh, reported numbers historically. Uh, so I'm getting here a, a revival in production from approximately now in, um, in, in May. Uh, production will probably start growing again and we'll have about a uh, 500,000 barrels per day increase in production from, from now till the end of the year. Uh, but then if you stay at uh, a thousand wells per month, um, and we, and if we don't see any more uh, productivity improvements, production yearly growth in production will drop down to below 500,000 barrels from 2024, a little bit weaker again, 2025, and so forth. So we'll 
I've assumed that we'll see uh, an annual growth of uh, about a half a million barrels per day after 2023 in the US shale space. Um, what, what does that mean for imports and exports and so forth in the US? Uh, well, the fact is that the US refining system is, uh, is um, the most complex in the world. They have a lot of coking and cracking capacity in the US. Uh, and um, uh, so they're able to, to digest and run a fairly heavy sour crudes. Uh, as you can see, the average uh, API number run in the, in the US um, refining system uh, about years ago was 30 API that has been able to, to creep up to 33 API. So that means they're processing somewhat like the crudes in the US uh, refining system. Uh, but the WTI quality is above 40 API. So it has a lot uh, more lighter uh, components in it in the WTI than actually what the refiners would like to process. Uh, and actually, that is also, uh, uh, somewhat of a challenge for the U.S. refining system because almost all the shale production is light sweet, as you can see here on the, the graph up to the, to the right. Uh, the gray part of it is API of 40. So most of the, of the production in the U.S. is API, uh, above API 40, so light sweet crudes. Uh, heavy production uh, below uh, 25 API is almost thing. Uh, and uh, so that's why the, the US um, uh, refineries, they have continued to import uh, their heavy sour barrels, as you can see the, the, the green part um, in, in the two graphs at the bottom. And what's this going to mean when the refining system in the US is probably ramping up by maybe one and a half to maybe at the max two million barrels per day from now to August? Um, well, probably um, their exports uh, is going to increase again. It has ticked somewhat lower, but it's been keeping up fairly well, uh, the US exports, despite the drop in production. Um, but exports uh, will probably increase when the, uh, when the um, uh, production is coming up because the US refining system is not really interested in, in those light sweet barrels. As you can see, the average intake in the US refining system is actually exactly the same API as Arab Light, which is the, the number one export pro, uh, crude stream from, from Saudi Arabia. So that's the type of crude that they, uh, they prefer to run. Now, when it comes to imports, so that means the imports part could actually increase uh, at the same time as exports is increasing. So you could actually get a, a very nice uh, impulse to the, to the global uh, freight of, um, uh, of crude oil from uh, the increased refinery throughput in the US and also from the increased um, uh, production that we expect from the US at these current uh, oil price levels. Um, and what's going to lead all this is, of course, uh, a huge uh, revival in demand. And what I've done is to I've tracked uh, six of the most influential banks, uh, Citi, Morgan Stanley, Goldman, uh, Stanchart, uh, JP Morgan, Barclays. And I've looked at um, um, four consultancies, Platts, uh, NG Aspects, Woodmack and Restad, and the three agencies, IEA, um, EIA and OPEC. And as you can see, the dotted line shows their average demand forecast from Q1 to Q4 this year. Um, so there's a huge agreement in the market that we, um, we will see uh, an extremely large demand recovery from the first half of this year to the second half of this year. Uh, actually, uh, from, um, from the first half to the second half of the year, they're expecting on average four and a half million barrels per day higher demand in the second half of this year. The average for that number is one and a half million barrels per day, because the second half of the year is always a stronger demand than the first half of the year. The average, one and a half. This year, predicting four and a half million barrels per day on average for, for these 13 influential analysts. Uh, and of course, uh, right now we are in a period with very high refinery maintenance. We are in the shoulder um, uh, month uh, for demand in May. Uh, so refineries are going to come out of the refining ma uh, refinery maintenance. Uh, it's going to happen uh, in China and Asia, but it's mainly going to happen in the OECD this time. So you can see refinery throughput here. Um, that's the IEA data down to the left. It's really the OECD part that's going to be outperforming the time. 
uh, for once, instead of uh, non-OCD, which uh, have already seen a large uptick in their refinery throughput. Now it's going to be mainly driven by increased refinery throughput in the OECD, in the US and in Europe, um, which will be the main, main to it. And we see that gasoline and gas oil margins have improved recently. So, so the, the red line there is the um, uh, gas oil margin and the black line is the gasoline margin in Europe. So uh, there's room to increase and probably gasoline is gonna be the star performer um, uh, the next uh, two, three months. Of course, that could go on the expense of the gas oil uh, diesel margins uh, because the market will, will, will focus on producing enough uh, gasoline for this summer. Now, what about the little bit longer term demand uh, uh, forecasts? Well, if you look at the, um, uh, at the agents and the um, and um, uh, and some um, uh, and BP and Equinor, for example, if you track uh, and they, you know the banks normally doesn't provide you with the 2050 forecasts, but so this is uh, from the IA, it's from uh, from some consultancies, uh, and we also track BP and Nor here. And I've also put in the um, the net zero um, assumption from uh, the IEA that actually if we're supposed to reach net zero emissions by 2050, which put the, puts us on a 50% chance of reaching one and a half degree temperature rise, we should see demand falling from uh, 90 million barrels per day in 2020 to 24 million barrels per day in in uh, 2020 uh, in 2050. Oops. Uh, this is not. This is one of many scenarios, and this is what the IEA say. Uh, it, that's what brings us uh, to net zero. Um, the fact, however, is that most agencies and consultancies and banks they don't believe in that scenario. Uh, and I think there's a lot of um, there's a lot of um, assumptions in that scenario that is very hard to believe. For example, that we will see 64% market share. Uh, for um, uh, for electric vehicles already in 2030. That's nine years down the road, and they're also assuming uh, you know 30 percent market share for electric uh, heavy duty trucking already nine years down the road. I just don't think it's believable. And I think one of the key issues here uh, is uh, has to do with security of supply, uh, both on the personal level. I've already you know shown you the picture on the on the um, electricity system in in Delhi, for example. How would you? There's no security by owning a Nissan Leaf in in Mumbai, uh, and of course, as a, a country like India, uh, they, they don't. They just like uh, like we in the northern hemisphere, we, we worry about the next 20 years. They have to worry about this evening, um, and basically just uh, surviving this evening. And they, they call it's it's very hard for a country like that to to not use, for example, their domestic coal resources. Um, because um, with the solar equipment, for example, 90% of their uh, solar equipment is imported. That doesn't bring you, you know, security uh, of supply in such a volatile region as India. And when it comes to, to behavioral changes, we need to have huge behavioral changes to, to reach this um, uh, net zero scenario. And actually in the World Energy Outlook uh, published by the IA in November, um, in their uh, in their stated policy scenario, they don't expect uh, the uh, the effects of COVID to to have any any change in behavior actually, because we have, of course, uh, counting in the negative direction is uh, teleworking. People work more from home. People are flying less. Um, you have uh, uh, deferred car sales. However, what turns in the other direction is uh, people buy more SUVs than ever before. The low fleet turnover means that the age of the fleet is older and people are using public transport less than before. So they choose to, to drive to work instead of taking the bus and the train. So the net effect is probably likely to be zero from the, from the COVID-19 um, uh, story. So here's are some examples that, that makes it difficult to believe in the net zero pathway uh, from the IEA. Uh, so uh, for example, 64% of all car sales should be electric by 2030. Uh, fuel cell vehicles and, uh, and um, electric vehicles should be 30% of heavy duty truck uh, sales uh, already in 2020. They were less than 0 0.1 in 2020. They're supposed to be 
30% just nine years down the road. And by 25, uh, basically all cars sold globally should be electric. Uh, and to reach the net zero, the world needs to install the size of the largest existing solar plant every day until 2030. And the world needs to, to build 10 dogger banks, which is the largest offshore wind plant in the world, every year until 2030. And another um, assumption on, on aviation is that um, the um, uh, long haul flights for leisure stays at 2019 levels. They don't increase anymore. They, they've always increased earlier, but they, they stop increasing. So that means if you have a growing middle class, those people, they won't fly anymore on, on, on holidays. And maybe the most important thing is the, the lack of uh, and, and supply of critical minerals. Uh, so the IEA just released a report um, that they call about the critical minerals for the renewable industry, where one of the uh, conclusions is that the supply of lithium and cobalt uh, is 50% is lower than the requirement in the market by 2030, um, uh, according to the sustained development scenario. Uh, the 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 number the the amount of lithium and cobalt we will need to feed the the um, uh, EV story. Uh, so that means uh, the mining industry you know, they have on average 16 and a half year from uh, from discovery to production, uh, and they're still supposed to be able to increase their production of these critical minerals uh, within just nine years to support this story. It's just not very believable, I think. But, and this, of course, has a lot to do with how you look at the longer term oil prices, because the cost of supply curve, if you think that uh, we will need to uh, replace or, or to cover oil demand up to 105 million barrels per day, that means you need to look at the cost of supply for about 108, 109 million barrels per day, because uh, there will be we have to assume there have to, has to be three to four million barrels per day spare capacity in the market. So, so that means basically suggesting that we need about 60, 65 dollars per barrel if oil demand reach 105 million barrels per day in the early 2030s. If oil demand has already peaked, well, you don't that high oil price to supply the barrels, of course. Uh, and, and that's why, why it's important price-wise. So uh, in, uh, in this scenario here, you see the base case uh, for me is that, we, as I've already said, we're reaching about 105 million barrels per day in 2030, which seems to require an oil price about uh, 60, 65 dollars per barrel. But if you're more at the uh, believe in the sustainable development scenario, then we've already seen peak oil demand. Uh, and, um, and down the road uh, in, in 2030, 2035, we only took cover maybe 80, 90 million barrels per day, which requires a lower oil price, of course, to, to replace those barrels. Um, so that, that's why if you look at the net zero uh, pathway from the IA, they're expecting oil prices to, to drop uh, down to uh, 25, $28 per barrel by 2040 to 2050 in that scenario, where oil demand actually drops to 24 million barrels per day by 2050. Uh, but most other consultancies and, uh, and also the IEA um, stated policy scenario uh, assume something completely different. Uh, so in the stated policy scenario, the IEA is actually, they need oil prices to rise up to $8 per barrel, $80, $85 per barrel by 2040 um, um, in order to cover the demand growth that will, will um, materialize uh, in the stated policy scenario which is what they actually the, the politicians globally have, have stated of targets. Um, they have said, we want to limit production to one and a half uh, degree, but they haven't stated any, uh, any uh, laws or implemented the, the changes that are required to get there. But that's what the stated policy scenario is showing. Now, the big problem for the oil market is, of course, that we need to invest all the time uh, just to keep production where it is. So um, even in the sustainable development scenario, we need 50 million barrels per day of new uh, production to be put on street by 2040. Um, uh, and, and in that uh, scenario, uh, the IA is, is, um, is predicting uh, 57 to $53 per barrel uh, oil price in sustainable development scenario. Now, 
uh, if you look at the history for uh, for um, uh, new fields and what they have com contributed to in the ore market, you can see that the last 10 years, um, uh, we have seen one third of the new fields, uh, new production put on stream covering demand and two thirds covering field decline. And that is the big challenge for, for the oil market that basically most of the investments that we're doing is actually just to stand still production wise. And this is uh, the average decline from the base has been around 4% um, uh, since 2009. So that's about approximately the last 10 years. And herein lies the challenge because uh, we've seen this enormous drop in investments in the oil space uh, in 2020 due to the COVID crisis. So if you, if you um, adjust the numbers to constant $2019, you can see that this drop in investment was much larger than the 2015 to 16 drop. That was 21% uh, down. Now we see 30% reduction in one year. So 2020, uh, we saw, according to the IA, $315 billion investments in oil, uh, oil resources. And if we want to cover the stated policy scenario where demand actually um, uh, goes according to the stated policies, then in the period 2025 to 30, we need to step oil up oil to 488 billion US dollars. So that, that's up 55% from where we're standing now. And even in the sustainable development scenario, we need investments to, to come up about 5% from what we saw in 2020. The problem is there's no uh, signs of that happening in 2021 at least. So we see that the, the guided uh, capex uh, from the big oil companies is actually suggesting a flattish development, and, and the same goes for, um, for the industry. They're they're keeping very disciplined. They want to prioritize. They want to prioritize uh, reducing debt uh, and paying dividends and, and buying back shares. So we've actually already seen uh, several million barrels per day negative effect from the uh, from the drop in investments in. Um, uh, in 2020, and this is going to continue as we go along uh, if if um, the investments aren't coming up. And of, that's why, of course, the net zero report that came out from the IEA um, now this week is is quite dramatic because they're saying that we don't need to to invest in any more new uh, oil and gas projects from now on if we want to reach the net zero uh, target in 2050. And if that really materializes and, they, and, and demand actually is not performing like the IA is, is saying it should be performing in the 2050 uh, net zero scenario, then we will have way too little resources, uh, which means the oil price needs to you know, basically explode to the upside if that happens. So the challenge is basically, let's assume that uh, we have a 4% decline rate uh, we're starting at 100 million barrels per day. We lose 22 million barrels per day. We have a list of projects in OPEC and non-OPEC, 11.3 uh, plus 4.3. And then uh, if we want to cover 100 million barrels per day demand in 2025, we need about 6 million barrels per day shale production. Growth from 2019 to 2025. So that's more than a million barrels per day every year in growth. That doesn't happen at 40 or $50 oil prices. And we can see that the oil majors, they have been cutting their CapEx gradually. Uh, so the, the quarterly uh, trend in CapEx is trending down. Uh, their production is about flattish when you look at the oil equivalent output uh, from the oil majors. What they have done is to, to increase their debt levels by four times since 2007. So from 100 to $400 billion. So they need to reduce their debt. They need to stay disciplined. And that's also what the, um, the, investor, the investors want them to do. And the extra push is coming from the ESG side uh, and, and this uh, green shift and particularly pushed even a, a notch further with the IA um, coming out with this net zero report. So we can expect all large listed oil producers to be quite sensitive to, to those kind of, uh, of pressures. What does this mean? Well, it means that non-OPEC production will probably flatline uh, going forward. We'll see growth in the US, but we will see a, a drop in production from countries outside of, uh, of OPEC, Russia, USA, Brazil, and Canada. As you can see, that 
part of the market has already been in decline since about 2010 for the last decade. That's going to accelerate, um, uh, in my assumption, around 2023 and going forward. So that uh, decline rate is going to be higher. Um, so that leads to flattish non-OPEC production. What about OPEC? Well, this is one of the, uh, this is the key bullish argument for, of course, uh, the freight side, that OPEC production is going to increase by probably around 5 million barrels per day within the next 12 to 15 months. Uh, and purely because demand is growing in that side. And, the, and all that growth must be coming, uh, almost all of it must be supplied from OPEC, which has cut back, and has a lot of spare capacity right now. They have probably around 8 million barrels per day spare capacity. Uh, but they're going to return um, a lot of volume from Iran and, and also from, from the rest of OPEC. So that means going forward, you'll see non-OPEC, non-US losing market share. You'll see the US grabbing a little bit market share again and the OPEC again grabbing market share. So if we put all this together, look at the supply demand balance. Uh, you can see that we have been drawing stocks um, so far this year. It's not so easy to, to see on, on this graph, but the red line is, it has been below the, the green one, which is demand. Uh, so right now we're uh, fairly balanced. We're, we're drawing a little bit, uh, but if OPEC keeps on to their current plan um, and really doesn't deliver more volume as we go into the autumn and into 2022, then we'll see a fairly large um, supply demand deficit in the first uh, half of next year and, and opening up during the autumn this year. And then I'm assuming from, from May 2022 that really OPEC is in increasing production back to about 90% of, uh, of their max, uh, observed levels that we've seen the past five years after 2016. And I'm also here assuming Iran returning to 3.8 million barrels per day by May 2022. Um, but after that, you can see that even if demand uh, is very anemic growth-wise after 2025, um, supply is also very anemic. And here we start 2023, we basically used up all the spare capacity because OPEC has then delivered back to the market. What they um, uh, what they had to cut during the COVID crisis. So this is a quite a bullish picture for for the rest of this decade, uh, and it has a lot to do with uh, with the lack of investments and uh, and uh, probably what's going to be uh, higher net decline rates uh, in in the space after OPEC has returned their barrels. On top of this, we have a lot of geopolitical risks that could push uh, prices even higher. We have this known. Um, Hotspots, of course, you have uh, Iran here uh, under invest. They're going to put a lot of barrels back in the market, but they still uh, have uh, uh, struggling with lack uh, lack of access to capital. Uh, and the same with uh, Iraq, uh, Saudi Arabia, of course, extremely important for the oil market. Very young population. Um, there's internal risk with the ruling family. You have constant sabotage in um, in Libya still. You have some sabotage in Nigeria still. You have uh, Venezuela, uh, which is very hard to see them coming back very quickly, but we have assumed some growth. And there's a lot of risk with environmental policy in the US, of course, with, um, with new environmental rules. So for the shipping market, of course, it's very positive that we have now drawn down the, uh, the uh, inventory of oil which built to record levels. You can see here on the graph up to the right that um, we reached uh, oh my, about 270 million barrels above the 2015 to 19 average stock level in the OECD, which is uh, what OPEC prefer to track against. Uh, so they want to get the inventory levels in the OECD back down to uh, 2015 to 19 average. The latest reported number is from March, and you can see we are approaching um, uh, that average stock level. But probably, if you look at the demand balances and assume that they, the reported balances are correct from the IA, we are probably be, uh, below the, that average now in May. Uh, so actually, there's a risk here that OPEC might over-tighten this market um, if they um, continue to stick uh, with their uh, current quota system. They have, you know, they're supposed to deliver back 2 million barrels per day now in May, June, July, and Saudi Arabia is supposed to deliver back 1 million barrels per day, but probably we still need more than that going into 
uh, the fourth quarter and into the first quarter next year. So that's a very bullish setup for uh, for uh, shipping and freight rates. So uh, right now we've seen negative uh, VLCC rates. Uh, they're starting to creep up a little bit uh, the last couple of days I've seen. Uh, but uh, you know the, the the starting point is demand will grow by maybe five six million barrels per day within the next um, within the next twelve to fifteen months. So. Let's say if you have 1 million barrels per day, the demand growth that turns into exports growth uh, and, and the travel distance is, uh, is from uh, Trujara to, to China, for example, then you need, if VLCCs were to take it all, you would need uh, 20 VLCCs just for 1 million barrels per day extra. So for 5 million barrels per day, you would need 100 VLCCs. But let's say VLCCs take half of that, so that means 50 VLCCs. If if you if you increase the the demand by 50 VLCCs, you increase the utilization rates probably high enough to see uh, uh, higher freight rates in this kit. And um, of course, other positive things for the shipping market is that supply of new sh ships will be kept in check by the very low order book that we see in the whole space. Steel prices are rising. Yards seems to be filled up with orders to build container ships instead of, uh, of um, tankers. So all in all, we have a very nice prescription here for, for higher tanker rates and higher ship values ahead. And um, there's no wonder why Fronten uh, just bought six VLCCs uh, resales at uh, $94.3 um, uh, million dollars per vessel. You know, this might look cheap when we, we look back in, uh, on this in December. So with that, uh, on a positive note for uh, for tanker rates, um, I want to thank you for the attention. Uh, and then uh, it'll be interesting to see what other people are uh, are thinking about this in uh, in the marine money. <laughs>